to God. Well, we are glad to see you on this beautiful Sunday morning. Would you put your hands together and help me welcome our Orlando campus? Hey, Orlando. We have an amazing campus there in Orlando with an amazing group of people, as well as those that are connected with us online today from many different parts of the world. And uh, uh, we're glad to have them here with us. And I just want to make you aware that uh, you heard it during the uh, video announcements briefly, but we just came out of four weeks of movie mania. And uh, I mean, amen. Tremendous time. And uh, the, 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 the biggest win of all is that over the course of four weeks, we had 258 people say yes to Jesus Christ for the first time. Come on, you ought to get more excited than that. Come on, 258 people watched Hidden Figures and Captain Phillips and Beauty and the Beast and Creed, and God used the message in those movies to minister to their hearts and draw them into a relationship with him. I am glad about that. <laughs> That's more exciting than anything else we've done. Amen. Also want to just make mention to you, as you heard in the announcements as well, that on our next first Wednesday, which is Wednesday, November 1st, we have an extra special treat. I've been waiting all year to get us to this first Wednesday. We have Dr. Caroline Leaf come, and she's a neuroscientist, but she's also a minister of the gospel. And what I love about her is that she connects kind of how the brain works and how it affects our emotions. And, you know, the majority of the issues and problems that we face are not spiritual problems. They're mental and emotional problems. There are problems in that soulless realm, the mind, will, and emotions. And if you really want to figure out how to get free, how to get delivered, how to walk in victory, most of it comes by learning how to think differently and gaining dominion over this mind and renewing this mind. So I want to definitely encourage you to make it out for first Wednesday in November, Wednesday, November the 1st. And then for an extra special treat for the ladies, we're bringing her, keeping her over on Thursday night, uh, November the 2nd, for a special ladies' night. Come on, all the ladies, shout amen. Special Ladies Night just for the ladies on that Thursday night, November the 2nd. So we encourage you to take advantage of that. Come out for Wednesday night for First Wednesday. Come back, ladies, for our uh, Ladies Night on November the 2nd. And it promises to be an absolute blessing to your life. We are kicking off a new series today, a new teaching entitled Built to Last. And I've been uh, anxious to get to this place because I really believe that God's going to say some things over the course of these next three weeks really to just kind of encourage some of you and to remind you that the stuff you're made of is the stuff that is, is, is built to last. You know, you're not, you're not you know, made of the stuff that cowers under pressure and, 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 and falls out under temptation. And I just know that when, when God is ready to take you to another level of increase and promotion, the enemy tries to come at you with everything he has to try to stop you from going to where God wants you to go. But I know this much about you. You are not born of anything that's caused to quit. The stuff on the inside of you is built to last, and you will make it to the end of that destination. So turn your Bibles with me to James chapter 1 today. James chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can share with that person sitting next to you. Or lift up your hand and just keep it up for a few moments, and one of our hostesses will be glad to place a loner Bible into your hand. James chapter 1 today. We're going to read as our, our text verse today, verse number 12. James chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man. The word blessed means fortunate, happy, prosperous, to be envied. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Everybody say, endures temptation. Endures. Come on, say it like me, mean, endures temptation. Endures. Now, the word temptation here literally refers to temptations, tests, or trials. So what it's really saying is, when problems come up against you, when difficulties come your way, when things don't go the way you thought they would, you are blessed if you can make it to the other side of those problems. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. In other words, when you endure temptation, when you endure tests, when you hang around and you, you're, you're there to the other side of those trials, the Bible says there's a crown, there's a victory, there's a reward for the one that doesn't quit in the middle of temptation. In fact, I love what the Good News translation says. <clears throat> it says, happy are those who remain faithful under trial. Tell your neighbor, you got to stay faithful. Come on, tell them like you mean, you've got to stay faithful. Happy are those who remain faithful under trials because when they succeed, watch this, in passing such a test, 
they will receive as their reward the life which God has promised to those who love him. In other words, if you're going through a test right now, if you're going through a trial right now, if you're going through a temptation right now, if there is something coming against you that has made you say, I don't want to deal with this anymore, the Bible says what you're really doing is that you're going through a test. And the Bible says there's a blessing on the other side. When you pass the test, and remain faithful in the middle of the test, then on the other side of the test, there's something called promotion. Come on, say amen, somebody. Now, we all like promotion. Everybody likes to go to the second grade when you're in the first grade. You want to go to the 10th grade when you're in the ninth grade. But in order to get to the next level, you have to demonstrate that you have the stuff that it takes to make it in that next grade level. And just like it is in life, just like it is in school, whenever it's time for promotion in the kingdom of God, there's a testing process we have to go through. Now, let me be very clear. It's not God that is testing you. God doesn't need to test you. He is Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. He is all-knowing. He knows everything about us. He knows more about us than we know about ourselves. So God doesn't need to test us, but life will test us. And sometimes God will allow us to see that when you get to the next level of increase that I have for you, you already have what it takes to make it there. Amen. Because there's more on the inside of you than you sometimes give yourself credit for. Shout amen, somebody. There are seasons, seasons in this thing called life where we are called to demonstrate the authenticity of our spiritual DNA. In other words, there are some times in this life where we have to prove that we really are qualified and we really have the stuff that God created us with. And on the inside of us, we have what it takes to make it through any situation. There's some seasons in life where we have to demonstrate the authenticity of our DNA, prove the stuff that we're made of. We live today in, in a very prominent quitting culture. We live in a culture of, of, of quitting. We live in a culture where, you know, kids sign up to play baseball and the first time they don't you know, do well in baseball, they quit. We, sign up, we live in a culture today where somebody takes a job and the moment that things don't go their way, they quit. You better say amen, somebody. Amen. We live in a culture today where folks quit on jobs, they quit on marriages, they quit on friendships, quit on churches, just quit on things without going through the process to see what's on the other side of their difficulty. It's one of the reasons why you look up today and you see so many instances, and it's almost become commonplace, it's sad to say, to where you get somebody that gets to the place where they just quit on life, and they decide, you know, life is too tough, I'm tired of dealing with this, tired of dealing with that, and they take a gun or some other device and go in and kill up a bunch of people in their workplace, or like we saw a couple weeks ago, sadly, in Las Vegas, just go into a hotel room and just open fire on a bunch of innocent folks that you know nothing about. These are not folks you've been working with, people you have no relationship with, and then take the coward's way out and then kill themselves. Well, that's because we are living in a culture of quitting. And what God wants us to do as the body of Christ is understand that we're not made of material that crumbles under pressure. We're not made of material that shrinks under pressure, and we're not made of material that cowers under pressure because we are built to last. We got to understand that Satan is not smarter than us. We have to mind of Christ. Thank you for those three amens. Let me say, Satan is not smarter than me. I've got the mind of Christ. Right, can I get an amen? Satan is not smarter than us. We have the mind of Christ. Can I also say, Satan is not stronger than us. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. But the thing we do need to understand about our enemy, and I don't even like talking about him much, but the thing we need to understand about him is that he's been around a long time. And so he has observed the tendencies of human nature, and he has learned how to push those hot buttons that many of us have that have a tendency to make us quit. All of us have certain things, certain pressure points in our spiritual life. That if certain things get pushed, we can brush that off, no big deal. But if certain other areas get attacked, we're more prone to be ready to say, I can't take this anymore. And Satan has specialized in paying attention to us enough to figure out what are those hot buttons that if he pushes those long enough and sends enough repeated attacks at us, we're ready to throw our hands up and quit on the purpose and plan that God has. Over in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul was writing to the church. You know that the, the, the book of 2 Corinthians was not written to be a book in the Bible. Paul wrote this letter to the church at Corinth, the second letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth. And as he's writing these letters, he's, he's correcting different things and he's instructing them. 
And in this one case, he's writing to them because there's a brother in the church there at Corinth that has gotten into some trouble and has to go through what, what they what we refer to as church discipline. They've had to correct him. But in the process of correcting him, they've, they've gotten kind of carried away with it to where they've punished him and then they punish him some more and then folks aren't speaking to him, folks aren't talking to him. And Paul has to come back in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and he's got to say to them, now if you don't turn on the switch of love at some point, what turned out as biblical correction is going to go too far and you're going to open yourself up for the enemy to be able to attack you. In fact, he says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11. He says, after all, we don't want to unwittingly give Satan an opening for yet more mischief. We're not oblivious to his sly ways. I like what the New King James Version says. It says that we're simply not ignorant of his devices. You know what that means? That means when it says we're not ignorant, that means we're not uninformed. We're not unaware of his plans, of his tricks, and of his schemes. In other words, we can see the devil coming from a mile away. I mean, glad to be in a church where you get taught the actual word of God. I mean, if you don't realize it, it is a blessing to be in a place where you're being taught the word of God. It, it heightens your spiritual senses. There's some people who have no idea what Satan is doing. They have no idea how he operates, so they just get clobbered all the time. There are other folks who, who know how he operates, but can muster up the spiritual strength and courage to do what the Bible says. They know they need to forgive so-and-so, but their flesh won't let them. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. And so they end up getting clobbered. And so what my job is for these next couple of weeks is I'm operating like a coach, you know, a coach of a football team like our Jacksonville Jaguars who happen to be playing pretty good right about now. Come on, we better celebrate early in the season. We don't know how this thing's going to turn out. <laughs> but one of the things that coaches do is after the game, the coaches go and break down film for you. And the coaches show you what you were doing that was right and wrong. But then they also get scouting film on the other team that you're coming up against. And they tell you the things that they do well, the things that they do wrong. They show you what plays they have a tendency to run in this situation. So that you know, if we get to a goal line stand on with, with two yards to go, and, and uh, this is the type of play they normally run. They normally run a play action, hand it off, and, 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 and try to run right up the middle. They normally run a boot, naked bootleg and come around the outside. The coaches break down the film so that we as a team understand what our enemy is going to probably try to pull against us. I want to tell you today over these next three weeks that the three, three of the primary tools that the enemy tries to use against us is problems, People and pride. Three of the primary tools he tries to use to get us to quit is he likes to use problems, he likes to use people, and he repeatedly tries to use pride. And when I'm talking about pride, I'm talking about trying to get us to do this life without God operating with us. Trying to get us to figure this thing out all by ourselves without inviting God into every aspect of our lives. When we do that, we find ourselves in trouble. Turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, beginning at verse number 28. Jesus is speaking, talking to his disciples. He says, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials. In other words, the difficulties I've gone through, you're the ones that have stuck right here with me every, every step of the way. He says, and because of that, in other words, you've been with me through the difficulties. You've gone with me through the trials. Remember, I told you, if you stay true through the trials, there's a reward on the other side. So Jesus says in verse 29, and based on that, I bestow upon you a kingdom just like my father bestowed one upon me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And the, and, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. Everybody say sift, sift. like wheat. Say it again, sift, sift. like wheat. Like Jesus said, he's asked for you, Simon, so he can sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. 
And when you have returned to me, come and strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus turned around and told him, look, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Well, now, Jesus, I want you to understand this because what he says to them is, you've been faithful to me. You've stuck with me through trials, and now I'm bestowing upon you a kingdom. You're going to be rewarded for the fact that you have stuck it out through trials. But I want you to see what happens when the devil knows promotion is coming your way. The enemy can see, and I used to say this way, when promotion is getting ready to happen, that's when the enemy attacks. As I was studying this out, the Lord corrected me. He said, it's not when promotion is getting ready to happen. When promotion has already happened in the spirit realm, when you just don't see it yet in the natural realm. See, before things happen in the natural realm, it always takes place in the spiritual realm first. Everything we see in the natural first starts off in the spirit realm. Jesus had just said to them, I am giving you a kingdom. And you'll sit with me upon thrones to help judge the, the tribes of Israel. In other words, I'm promoting you, Peter, Matthew, promoting you, John, promoting you, Thomas. I'm bumping you all up in your spiritual authority in the spirit realm. Then he turns around and says to Peter, and by the way, Peter, Satan has desired to have you so he can sit you like wheat. In other words, he wants to test the authenticity of what you're made of, Peter. Somebody say amen, somebody. Amen. See, this ought to help some of you understand what you're going through. This ought to help some of you understand the reason why it feels like all hell has broken loose in your life. It ought to help some of you understand the reason why it feels like, has God left me? Has God just forgotten what I'm, what I'm dealing with? It's not that he's forgotten. God understands I promoted you because I know you have what it takes. I've increased you in the spirit realm because I know that you have what it takes. Now you just got to use the stuff I have given you. So you can watch me use that thing, those things, to promote you to that next level of increase because on the inside, it's already a done deal. Amen. 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 Satan desires to have you so he can sift you like wheat. The word sift here comes from a Greek word, sinazo. It means to shake in a sieve or strainer. To shake in a sieve or strainer. It also means to try one's faith by inward agitation to the verge of overthrow. Satan desired to have you so he can sift you. He wants to sinazo you. He wants to sift you like wheat, to shake you in a strainer, to try your faith with internal agitation to the verge of overthrow. What does it mean to agitate? To agitate means to excite, to disturb, or trouble. It means to move or force into violent, irregular action. Satan desired to have you so he can sift you like wheat. He wants to agitate you on the inside to try to overthrow you. Satan has desired to have you so like to, to, to sift you like wheat. He wants to excite you, disturb you, trouble you. He wants to move you to violent, irregular action. One of Satan's tricks is to stir us up at our weakest point of agitation until we get to the place where we end up being outside the boundaries of God's will. See, it's kind of like what, what happens when, 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 when they're making wheat. When they're making wheat, they go out into the, into the field and they, they gather up all the wheat. But then they have to come in and they have to put it into a, into a strainer. And when they put that wheat into a strainer, they start off with it, a whole lot of wheat in this one strainer. And then they have to take the wheat and they have to shake it back and forth. And as they shake it back and forth, this is the process of sifting. And this is what's going on on the inside when you find yourself agitated. You find yourself as a single person lonely and the enemy's trying to shake you and tell you how lonely you are. And how, you know, everybody else is getting married except for you. Come on, talk to me, somebody. And the enemy wants you, wants you to get to the place where you're so discouraged because everybody else seems to be getting married but nobody. And he wants to see if he can get you to act in a violent, irregular way. Get you to jump out and marry somebody that, that, that you don't like, somebody that you don't love, somebody that's way older than you, way younger than you, somebody that's not even saved, somebody that can't, can't provide for you or doesn't love you, somebody that went to church many years ago but never know anything about the Lord today. I'm preaching real good. He wants to try to agitate you to see if he can get you outside the will of God. He wants to agitate you and make you feel disrespected so you walk in there and quit your job. 
I ain't got to take this. Huh? Don't they know who I am? Well, he's, 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 he's shaking you. Huh? He's rattling your cage a little bit to see if he can get you to go ahead, throw in the towel, and quit before you see the manifestation of what God has. He wants to shake you with enough financial pressure. Watch this. So you stop trusting God. You stop tithing. You start doing it on your own because he's hoping if he can shake you long enough, he can shake out all the good stuff God is trying to do on the inside of your heart. What we got to do is we got to do what the Bible says. We are smart enough to see him coming from a mile away. I know that promotion is on the other side of this, and you can shake all you want to shake. While you're shaking, I'm going to lift my hands and just praise God in the middle of this shaking. Because I already know on the other side of this sifting, God is, already, God is not going to do it. He's already done it. And the, devil, the reason why the devil is trying to shake you right now, because he's so terrified of what's going to happen when that thing in the spirit realm shows up here in the natural realm, which is why you ought to go ahead and praise God right now for what is coming down the pipe. Come on, praise God with me right now. Come on, I said praise him with me right now. Come on, let's praise him right now. Come on and praise him right now. Don't wait till the battle is over. Come on and shout now. Come on and shout now. Wake him up. Come on and shout now. Come on and shout now. Come on and rejoice now. Hallelujah. We don't have to wait until our eyes have seen it. We trust God enough that we can thank him in advance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. I said amen. amen. This is what happened in Job's life. When you go back and read the story of Job, Job found himself in a position where he was the richest man in the East. He had more cattle than everybody else. He had more sheep than everybody else. He had ten, he had seven sons and three daughters, ten children. Job is living a good life. But then the Bible says Satan shows up saying, can I have Job, in other words. Now, if you read it in, 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 the, in the New King James or the King James Version, it looks like God sells him up the river. It's look like, it looks like God says, have you considered my servant Job? Well, what God really said is, I know what you've been doing. You've been trying my servant Job. You've been considering my servant Job. And if you really look at it, what he's really saying is, there's a hedge that is down in Job's life. And under the Old Testament, there is no grace of God. They weren't living under the banner of the, the blood of Jesus Christ like we do today. So when somebody's hedge was down, they were an open target for the enemy to come in and attack them. And I can tell you the reason why Job's hedge was down in just a minute. But what happened is Job's hedge is down, so the enemy comes and he tries to sift him. How do you know when you're being sifted? Because you get repeated bad news just showing up. Job is out there minding his own business. Somebody comes from the field and says, oh, Job. A bad storm happened, and, and, and all the cattle got taken out. And the Bible says while that guy was talking, somebody else showed up. And said, oh, my goodness, Job, this happened to all the sheep. And while that guy was talking, another guy shows up. Oh, my goodness, I'm the only one that escaped to come and tell you that all the camels got taken out. And while that guy is talking, somebody else shows up. Oh, my goodness, Job, you won't believe what happened. Your kids were having a party at the house. And the roof collapsed and killed all 10 of the kids. Bad news after bad news after bad news after bad news. Now, Job opened up his mouth and said something he thought was right. And we've been repeating it because Job said it, but it doesn't make it right. Job said, though the Lord slay me, yet I'll still trust him. It's good to have a heart that says no matter what's going on, I'm still going to love God. But the reality was it wasn't God that was slaying Job. Eventually, Job's health gets attacked. His wealth gets attacked. Job is there. He still had this mindset, no matter what's going on, I'm still going to praise God. Now, if you go back and you study out what happened, the Bible tells us in Job chapter 3 what really went down. Verse 25 says, For the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded, Job said, has happened to me. The Good News translation says it this way, Everything I fear and dread comes true. In other words, Job was walking around. He was terrified something was going to happen to his kids. He was terrified he was going to lose all of his money. 
He was terrified that all the stuff he built up was somehow or another going to come collapsing down. So what Job was doing, you can read it later on. Every time his kids had a party, he would go and sacrifice an animal to God. Because Job said, it might be that my kids have sinned and cursed God. He has no evidence. He has no proof. So if, you, if you're one of Job's neighbors, you look at Job, and he's slicing an animal open. He's putting it on the altar. He's worshiping God. You look at Job, and you go, wow, Job is really a, a righteous man. But in reality, his righteous actions were birthed out of fear. And anytime we start being moved by fear to do something that looks like the right thing or something that looks like the wrong thing, it always turns out bad. Job said, the very thing I was terrified of having happen ended up being the thing that happened to me. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot afford to let fear move you. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. You cannot afford to let fear push you around. You cannot afford to be afraid something's going to happen to your kids. You cannot afford to be afraid that you're going to lose all your money. We got to put our full trust and confidence in God. No matter what happens in this life, God's got my back. Come on, God's got my front. Come on, God's got my side. Everything about my life is being covered, not because of how good I've been. It's being covered because God has been good to me. Turn your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 7. You still with me today? Luke chapter 7, let's pick up at verse number 14. It says, Then Jesus came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and the surrounding region. And the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus and said, Watch this, Are you the coming one, the Messiah, or should we be looking for somebody else? Now I want you to catch this because... These words seem innocent enough. It almost seems like John's just trying to get some some clarification. Are are you the Messiah that's coming? Or should we be looking for for another? Let me tell you how John really said this. Look, are you the Messiah or not? Or should we be looking for somebody else? How do you know he said that way? Because if you go back and study out John chapter 1, it was John when he saw Jesus coming who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It was John who the next day got up and said again, Behold the Lamb of God. Three different times in John chapter 1, John acknowledged himself he knew who Jesus was. It was John who Jesus came to and allowed him to baptize him. And when he baptized him, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and his voice from heaven said, Behold my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. John heard all that. It was John who was only six months older than his younger cousin Jesus who heard the stories about how the two of them were born. John has known since he was a little bitty boy that Jesus was the one that was supposed to come. The reason why he's asking this is because he's in jail at the moment. He's in jail. He's been arrested by Herod because he, tried, he told Herod that it was not legal for him to marry his brother Philip's wife. Herod got mad, threw him in jail. And instead of God's power setting him free, have you ever stopped to ask yourself the question? How did the guy that the Bible says about this, uh, this concerning John, Jesus said, among the men born of a woman, there's been nobody greater than John the Baptist. Come on, that's a powerful statement. That means Jesus said John the Baptist is greater than Elijah. John the Baptist is greater than Isaiah. Jesus said it, not me. Jesus said John the Baptist is greater than Jeremiah. How does the guy that Jesus says was greater than all those Old Testament prophets end up having his life halted by having his head cut off? Because we know God knows how to deliver deliver folks out of prison. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Daniel's in the lion's den, gets delivered. Three Hebrew boys thrown into the fiery furnace, get delivered. Peter in jail in the book of Acts gets delivered. How does John the Baptist get his head cut off? You want to know? Because he let himself get sifted. He's in jail, and he's upset because Jesus is out here healing people. (laughs) Jesus is out here preaching sermons. Why haven't you become the Messiah we thought you'd be? Why haven't you put an army together, established your royal cabinet, 
broken free from these Romans and go ahead and establish Israel as a nation and get me out of this prison cell. And because he got offended with him, he sent his disciples to go ask him, go ask Jesus, are you the one that's supposed to come or should we be looking for somebody else? Offense will cut your life off if you don't fix it. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. It'll cut your life off. Look at what verse number 20 says. When the men had come to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you the coming one or should we look for another? And that very hour, notice what Jesus did. He didn't even answer. That very hour, he cured many of infirmities. He healed many people from their afflictions and evil spirits. And many blind people, he gave them their sight. Then he said, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard. I like, I think Mark's version says, go tell John again. The things you've seen and heard, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is the guy who doesn't let himself get offended because I'm not doing things the way he thought I should be doing them. The reason why John the Baptist was offended, watch this, is because he thought Jesus would do it a different way. How many times do we get in trouble because we thought it should go one way? A lot, of our, a lot of our inward agitation happens from this place, this, this, this bad place of trying to control everything. Amen. We can't control stuff we don't understand. Amen. And there's a place where we have to just acknowledge within ourselves that I can't control everything going on in my life. <clears throat> I can't try to be the master of my whole domain. At some point, I got to throw my hands up and declare either I trust God or I don't trust God. Amen. If John the Baptist had simply trusted, Jesus isn't doing what I thought he would do the way I thought he would do it. But I trust his character. Surely when it's all said and done, it'll work out the right way. If he had done that, he would have still been alive at that time. He'd have still been able to finish out his ministry. But because he let his heart get twisted, he let himself, let, let himself get sifted. He found himself in a position where not only did he not finish out his ministry, he didn't even finish off the course of his life. I don't know about you. I don't want to let my head get cut off because I let offense get the best of me. Come on, say amen, somebody. Amen. Listen to this from John chapter 14. The Amplified Bible says, peace I leave with you. My own peace I now give and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. <clears throat> do not let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. In other words, what, what, what Jesus was saying is, look, I'm giving you some peace. I'm leaving you the same peace that I operated with. Then he turned around and said, now don't let yourselves be troubled. Jesus didn't tell his disciples to pray for all their problems to go away. Listen to me. He, he didn't pray for them to pray for all their problems to go away. He said, stop letting those problems bother you. I wish somebody would help me out today. I mean, I mean, we want to pray for every problem to go away. Jesus didn't, he didn't say, pray that every single problem that you have disappears by tomorrow morning. What he said was, stop letting those problems get the best of you. Stop letting those problems agitate you. Stop letting those problems get you so worked up. Stop allowing it to happen. Whenever we get to a place where we find ourselves saying, I can't take this anymore, we're right on the verge of giving up and quitting because quitting happens in the mind before it ever happens in our actions. Amen. Amen. And there is a pathway that God will take us through to keep us from getting to that place of quitting when we have problems that come up against us. First thing we need to understand is that God has called us to choose joy. Choose joy. Over everything else, we got to choose joy. You can never get to the place of winning if you won't choose joy. Joy is the thing. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength, which means if I'm going to be strong enough to be built to last, come on, say amen, somebody. If I'm going to be strong enough to be built to last, i got to find some joy on the inside. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Count it all joy. Count it all joy for the most powerful words you can ever receive in the quicksand of bad news. You get some bad news, you feel yourself slipping like you're in quicksand, Four of the most powerful words you could ever receive is count it all joy. 
You know what count it all joy means? Count it all joy means act like it's joy when it's really not. Any spiritual folks in here? <laughs> Any folks in here that consider themselves, you know, I'm pretty mature. I'm walking in things. God. I've been walking with the Lord for a while. Well, you, we get a chance to find out how mature we are when tests and trials come our way. Come on, it's easy to be mature in the sunshine. We really get a chance to find out how mature we are, how much of this word is on the inside of us. When God has promoted us in the spirit realm and Satan is trying to oppose our promotion, and then we got to make a decision, am I going to just give in to it and be depressed, be discouraged, throw my hands up, give up and quit? Or am I going to do what the Bible says, which is counted joy? How do you count it joy? When it's joy, you high five somebody. Come on, when it's joy, you got a smile on your face. Come on, when it's joy, you don't mind jumping up and shouting or dancing and running. When it's joy, even when you don't feel like it, you can still muster up some excitement and give God some praise. Amen. I said amen. There's a joy on the inside that God wants us to reach down and grab from the inside. Second thing we've got to do in our lives, we've got to find some joy-filled people. Find some joy. So we've got to choose joy ourselves. But it's hard to choose joy if you're not around joy-filled people. Look at your neighbor and ask him, are you a joy-filled person? Come on, look at him and ask him, are you a joy-filled person? Look at the one on the other side and tell him, ask him, say, let me see what your joy looks like. <laughs> I've got a whole article here. I don't really have time to read it. It's in the U version notes if you have that. You can read the link later on. But it talks about all the health benefits of just laughing. One of the things that's wrong with so many Christians is that we become so deep and so serious that we've lost our joy. One of the best ways to get you through difficult times is you got to find some joy, man. And sometimes that means just getting around people who are joy-filled people. Amen? King James says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Not that we have dominion over your faith, but we are helpers of your joy. For by faith you stand. You know, we're called to be helpers of one another's joy, not agitators of one another's, uh, not instigators of one another's agitation. We're supposed to help each other's joy. You know, you ought to feel better when you walk away from me than you did when you came in my presence. Hmm? You should. I mean, anytime you get around real friends, real friends ought not be cracking jokes on you, belittling you, pointing out all your weaknesses and your faults and your failures every time you come around. And if you find yourself around people, watch this, that are zapping all the life force out of you, you got to get away from those folks. I just made up in my heart and mind, I'm not doing life and I'm not doing ministry with people that don't want to be around me. I'm not doing life and ministry with folks that, that, that pull life out of me. It's too hard doing life with people that every time you get around them, they pull your spirit down. Every time you get around, you got to ask, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong with you? Everything okay? What's wrong? I do something wrong. Come on, what's wrong? It's hard being around folks that have no joy. Now, we're called to minister to everybody, but you can't do life with everybody. I am called by God to love everybody. I have a choice who I become friends with. And I've just made up my heart and mind. I am not doing life and trying to be friends with folks that zap the life out of me. I'm a life-giving person. When I come around, I, I, I'm giving life to folks. But you got to be around folks that give life back to you as well. How do you know, if, how do you know if, 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 if they're that kind of people? Person, if every time you walk away from that individual, you got to go and pick yourself up. You got to get alone and pray in the spirit, turn on some religious music. <laughs> if you got to go grab a, a worship song every time you leave them. There's a good chance they're not adding any life to you. And while we are called, hear me out, to minister to everybody, you are not obligated to subject yourself day in and day out to people that just zap all the life out of you. It's too hard for you to deal with the problems that come against you 
when you have people around you that won't let your joy meter go where it's supposed to go. And even Jesus said that your joy ought to be full. He said, these things I have spoken unto you so that your joy might be full, which means Jesus wants your joy to stay topped off. And I'm saying, get around people, find you some circumstances and situations that keep adding joy to you, adding joy to you, adding joy to you, adding joy to you, so that you end up bubbling over with joy. Because if you're bubbling over with joy, guess what? You're going to be bubbling over with strength. If you're bubbling over with strength, whatever comes against you, you are built to last and you will deal with it the right way. Amen. Amen. So we've got to choose joy. We've got to find joy-filled people to be around. Listen to this. Life is too short to give it away to mean, negative, or bitter people. That's good preaching. Life is too short to give it away to mean, negative, or bitter people. When you find yourself around folks like that consistently, do yourself a favor. Excuse yourself. Do the little Baptist thing. Put, put your finger up like, I'm out of here. That's how we do it in the Baptist church I grew up in. <laughs> when you, I don't know what this meant, but when you got ready to leave, if it wasn't the right, if it wasn't the appropriate time to leave, you just put your finger up and go ahead, head toward the exit door. You get around a bunch of mean, bitter folks, just put your finger up. I, I, I ain't going to take too much more of this. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You messing up my joy. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Choose joy. Find some joy-filled people. And lastly, we got to learn some contentment. Learn contentment. Philippians 4.11 says this, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Everybody say content. Come on, everybody say content. What does it mean to be content? The word content means strong enough <clears throat> to need no aid or support. Content with one's lot. And I love this last definition. It means independent of external circumstances. Which means I'm not going up and down based on what's going on around me. I'm content. It means whether I got a lot of money in the bank or I got a little money in the bank, God has still been good to me. That means whether I got a lot of friends or just a few friends. God has still been good to me. That means whether I got 100% health operating right now, I got a few challenges in my body. I'm still alive, and God has been good to me. Amen. Independent of external circumstance. It means I'm not moved or swayed by the changing climate around me. It means that I made a decision that I'm going to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. <clears throat> thermostat on the wall, it sets the temperature. It, de it decides. This is where we're going. We're going to 75 degrees. And it just stays stuck there. If you don't come back and change it, it'll stay stuck there. It'll call until the, the machine wears out. But a thermometer on the other hand, whatever the temperature is, it changes every day. Walk into a room of dead folks. And <laughs> thermometer pulls down to that temperature. In the room of happy people, the thermometer comes up to that temperature. That makes life too hard when you're riding a roller coaster. God wants us to get up every day and just be like this. Be a thermostat. That means you get up in the morning. That's why it's important to pray early in the day. I know people work different work schedules. I'm a believer that whatever, whenever your day starts, I think that's when you ought to be praying. As your main prayer time. Get up before you start today. Get up and set the temperature for what my day is going to be. I've decided to be joy-filled. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in this day. Which means I'm not waiting to see what happens today. I will rejoice. I will be glad today. It's easy to rejoice when everything is going well. The question becomes, can you rejoice in the midst of difficulties? Now I'm telling you, you can. There's a quote I found some years ago. I, I love it, and, and, and I use it a lot. It says, life is not about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning how to dance in the rain. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? People sit around saying, yeah, as soon as I get married, I'm going to be happy. As soon as I get that promotion, I'm going to be happy. As soon as this storm passes by, I'm going to be happy. As soon as this happens, I'm going to take a breath and be happy. Life's not about sitting around waiting for the storm to pass. 
Get up and start dancing right now in the rain. He said, but it's pouring down. That's when the best dancing happens. Because that's when you know it's a dance of faith. Because I trust God more than I trust the circumstances I'm looking at. Somebody ought to lift your voice and give the Lord some praise in this place right now. Come on, somebody ought to go ahead and dance in the rain right now. Somebody ought to go ahead and rejoice in the Lord right now. Somebody ought to lift your voice and magnify the King of Kings. Somebody ought to lift your voice and bless the Lord. Come on and magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We bless your name, O oh God. We magnify your name, O oh Lord. Come on, the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We bless your name, O oh God. Come on, lift your voice and bless the Lord. Come on, lift your voice and bless the Lord. We bless you, Lord. Come on, even in the midst of difficulties, come on and bless the Lord. Even in the midst of troubles, we bless your name, O oh God. We bless your name, O oh Lord. We bless your name, O oh God. Hallelujah, we bless your name, O oh Lord. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lamb of God. How we bless your name, O oh Lord. How we bless your name, O oh God. We bless your name. We bless your name. Hallelujah, we bless your name. Hallelujah, we bless your name. Come on, lift up both hands and say this. Say, I will not give up. I will not quit. Say, problems, people, and pride will never get the best of me. I put my trust in God. I am built to last. Come on, say that. I am built to last. Come on, I am built to last. The stuff I'm made of is victorious DNA. And there's no devil in hell that can stop what God is doing in me. Now shout like you believe that today. Come on, shout like you believe it. Come on, Orlando, shout like you believe it. Come on, shout like you believe it. Come on, shout like you believe it. Shout like you believe it. Now, everything I've said today, it starts from this place of I'm in relationship with God. Because the third week, we're going to talk about the fact that the ultimate pride is to think that we can do this life without God. I'm here to tell you we can't. And the good news is we don't have to. I know what religion has told us. Religion has told you you've made so many mistakes. God is tired of you. God is tired of your mess. He's fed up with you. Truth of the matter is God knew about your mess before you knew about your mess. And he still stamped you love of my life. So your mess is not keeping you from God. You know what's keeping you from God? It might be lack of information. It might be guilt and shame. But really it's just one decision. Because you can get away from guilt, shame, all of that by just making a decision today to turn around and head in God's direction. I'm not saying you're a bad person. Every one of us in here has had to come this way at one time or another. There comes a time in all of our lives where we've got to make a decision to surrender our lives to Jesus. We can't just be good enough to go to heaven. We can't be good enough to earn a relationship with God. We've got to surrender our hearts and our lives to him. And when we do so, he will change us right there on the spot. So wherever you are right now, main auditorium, those in Orlando, those in our overflow rooms, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, would you please give me this opportunity to pray for you? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you here to the front of the church. Right there where you are, I want to lead you in a prayer today, a simple prayer. It will change your life forever if you give me this opportunity to pray with you right now. So every head is bowed, all eyes are closed in prayer. If you say, yes, Pastor, include me in on this prayer, then let me know right now that I'm praying for you by lifting up your hand right there where you're standing. Thank you. See that hand there? Come on, who else? Who else? Thank you. Another hand right there. Thank you. Another hand there. Come on, who else? Or raise your hand. You're saying, I'm not saved, but I'm ready to be saved today. I'm ready to give my heart to Jesus. Thank you. See that hand there? Ready to establish this relationship with Jesus Christ today. Today's my day. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of doing life on my own. Thank you for the hand in our overflow room. Come on, who else today? Come on, who else today? 
Who else today would say, yes, Pastor, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Another hand there. Once you raise your hand, you can put it down. We're not going to embarrass you. I just want you to raise your hand so you and God know I hear you talking to me, Lord. Come on. Who else today before we pray? Thank you. Another hand right there. Adults, teenagers alike. Who am I talking to? Who else out there would say something on the inside is telling me that I need to get in on this prayer? That's the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and say yes to him and just shoot your hand up if you haven't done so already. Who else? Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask believers that are in here, go ahead and begin praying softly right there at your seat. Pray fervently for these that have raised their hand. But every one of you that raised your hand for prayer, repeat this prayer out loud after me. Say it loud enough for you and God to hear. That's all. And God's going to change your life right there where you're standing. Say this out loud. Say, dear God in heaven, thank you for loving me today. Thank you for bringing me here to receive this word. I know that I'm built to last. You have a purpose for my life. And today I'm ready to receive that purpose. I believe Jesus died for my sins. But I believe you raised him from the dead. And he's alive right now. So Jesus, come into my heart now. Save me now. Forgive me now for trying to live life without you. I do believe in my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. And I confess you as my Lord. And according to the Bible, I'm right now born again. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put your hands together. Help me celebrate these men and women.